from the University of New South Wales. And the title of his talk is Doubled Experience, Imagistic Crossings Between the Interior and the City. Thank you, Victoria. A building replaced by a bookshelf, the city rescaled to a domestic interior. Increasingly, these sorts of large scale, sharp and cinematic images are appearing at key city sites and are carrying a communicative power not usually associated with buildings. Yet in many instances, this communicative power is associated with the domestic, with the interior and its modes of inhabitation that building facades are supposed to mask. This mediatized facade is beginning to put the relationship between city and interior into a new play. This play could be characterized with a certain sort of ambivalence as a spectacle of intimacy. This spectacle arrives not solely in the attempt to turn domesticity into a commodity, that these advertising images might tell us what to have, but in the attempt to offer an image of how to be. The ANZ Bank building turned bookcase in Sydney includes the discreetly placed slogan, Grow with ANZ. Judging by the carefully selected volumes on the shelves, from literary classics to travel books to art and design books, the bank would appear to be lending not solely the monetary capital to buy a house, but the cultural capital that is required to inhabit it successfully. Indeed, the ability to own a house is predicated on an identification with the mode of domestic inhabitation that is captured by the titles on this bookshelf. An image such as this produces a certain affect for the urban dweller. Generally, we come across them in our everyday paths through the city, these paths that are habitual. Not concerned with finding our way, our bodies can do that by themselves. Our minds only become engaged with the surroundings when something changes, when something grabs our attention. Not every image or advertising sign is able to do this, and it is almost banal to suggest that is, it is only the largest, sharpest, and in this way most surprising image that catch and divert our attention. Yet with these sorts of images, like the ANZ bank bookcase or this construction hoarding turned gift box, this quantitative value produces a qualitative shift one where the urban subject perceives images in a particular relation to the way in which they move through the space of the city. In these instances, we imagine the city rescaled as the space of a domestic interior. We might live out the effect of these images by continuing on our journey through the city in a new sort of space that would be formed through a reimagining of the city that the image prompts. As with this image, Kathy Freeman solicits our look and stares out over the freeway flyover that becomes her running track. To become Kathy, to just do it, the road ahead of us must take on something of the running track she sees ahead of her in the city. Freeman's stare becomes a switch between the ordinary, habitual space of the city and the space of a new possibility for those taken in by the image. Thus, the diversion of attention managed by these sorts of images is of a particular sort. We are diverted in the sense that we are both distracted by such images and absorbed into them, or more properly, into the space that they create around them. In this way, the distinction between the intimacy of an interiorized world and the distractions of the city can no longer be thought of in terms of a boundary, even a porous boundary, but rather in terms of the spatialization of an affect that is created through images. I propose that there are two ways to think about what is going on with these images. And these two ways, represented by Walter Benjamin and Roland Barthes, present at first consideration very different positions regarding the relation of the interior to the city.
In section 15 of the work of art essay, Benjamin likens the distractions inherent in viewing cinema's constantly changing images to the distracted perception bound up with our habitual experience of the city. And this is Benjamin. Distraction and concentration form polar opposites, which may be stated as follows. A man who concentrates before a work of art is absorbed by it. He enters into this work of art the way legend tells of the Chinese painter when he viewed his finished painting. In contrast, the distracted mass absorbs the work of art. This is most obvious with regard to buildings. Architecture has always represented the prototype of a work of art, the reception of which is consummated by a collectivity in a state of distraction. The laws of its reception are most instructive." End of quote. The reception of buildings, and more specifically, buildings in an urban environment, was most instructive for understanding how the cinematic image could not be taken in in a contemplative way as with the com conventionally framed work of art. The temporality of perception was controlled by the movement of the image and its montage in the film, rather than by the degree of attention a spectator chose to pay an image. The cinema and cinema going encapsulated a culture of distraction, which, when framed more broadly, was seen by Benjamin to mark a radical shift in cultural experience a shift from experience as duration and connection to tradition, or Erfahrung in German, to experience as the shock of the event, or Erlebnis in German. Cinema was the culturally progressive form of this shift. Its quality was its shock effect, and Benjamin gave a positive critical value to the position of cinema's distracted or absent-minded observer. The context of this thinking was Benjamin's investigation of the 19th century, 19th century through the Arcades Project, compiled roughly between 1927 and 1940. The Arcades Project staged an immersion into the dream world of the 19th century's prehistoric cultural forms and fragments. The purpose of this immersion into a dream world was to awaken from it, and thus to awaken from a dream of the present as that which is in direct and linear continuity with the 19th century past, a continuity marked by experience as duration. Benjamin's thinking about the revolution in perception and mass criticality posed by cinema goes hand in hand with the shock of awakening from such a complacent dream sleep. What I wish to note about the Arcades Project as the context for Benjamin's thinking about cinema and experience is its twofold relation to interiority. At one level, the formal structure of the Arcades project is that of an interior. The fragmentary and aphoristic texts which are held together in the various convolutes form a montaged surface of literal images which resonate together within an interiorized spatiality of historical and philosophical speculation. The eponymous Parisian shopping arcades were a ma material figure of this organizational structure. Benjamin himself commenting that, quote, arcades are, are houses or passages having no outside like the dream. But perhaps more impor importantly, the bourgeois domestic interior figures this structure most fully. And in Benjamin's expose, written as part of a fragmentary synopsis of the entire arcades project, the interior emerges for the bourgeoisie as a space separated from sites of work and productive labor and becomes a place of refuge from the city and its new shocking forms of experience. In the interior, subjects confront themselves in psychologically charged ways through the medium of objects and furnishings. Benjamin writes of the private individual inhabiting the interior by taking possession of things through divesting them of their character as commodities. He writes, the collector proves to be the true resident of the interior. By bestowing a connoisseur's value rather than a use value on objects, the inhabitant as collector of objects, quote, delights in evoking a world in which, to be sure, human beings are no better provided with what they need than in the real world, but in which things are freed from the drudgery of being useful, 
end of quote. More than just a description of parts of the content of the arcades project, which deal directly with the bourgeois interior, this account provides an analogy for the very structuring of the project, a device for the projection of the historical into the intimate. As the English translators of the Arcades Project remark, remark, quote, particularly from the perspective of the 19th century interior, which Benjamin likens to the inside of a mollusk's shell, things were coming to be seen more entirely material than ever, and at the same time, more spectral and estranged. In the society at large, and in Baudelaire's writing par excellence, an unflinching realism was cultivated alongside a rhapsodic idealism. Here, furthermore, in the wakening to crisis, crisis marked by habitual complacency, was the link to present day concerns." End of quote. From, this, from his perspective in the 1930s, Benjamin saw a socio-political necessity in moving beyond the bourgeois culture of domestic inhabitation and the dangerous illusions about culture's relation to memory and tradition that it supported by accepting in a positive sense a new poverty of modern cultural experience. This new poverty, the basis for experience as shock, involved erasing the traces of individual experience that the bourgeois interior allowed the inhabitants to accumulate. What is promoted instead of the privacy and secrecy of the interior is a kind of radical publicity, a habituation to modern life as rootless and constantly on the move. Modern life is beginning again with nothing but the spare change that can be carried over from a culture of stasis and dwelling. The distillation of this modern form of experience and habituation was to be found in the cinema. To put it bluntly and perhaps far too schematically, the illusions and imaginations supported by the bourgeois interior are sundered by the moving image, the control of which belongs to a mechanical rather than a personalized ordering principle. At its point of cultural impossibility, the bourgeois interior can be seen for what it is. In the awakening from it, it is perceived in its true form as a dream space. This moment of awakening has a curious but problematic resonance with the way in which Roland Barthes described some 30 or so years later leaving the movie theater. Barthes writes, he walks in silence. He doesn't like discussing the film he's just seen. A little dazed, wrapped up in himself, feeling the cold. He's sleepy, that's what he's thinking. His body has become something soppative, soft, limp, and he feels a little disjointed, even irresponsible. End of quote. Bart, speaking of himself in the third person, is coming out of a hypnosis. It is not something he can discuss, certainly not in the first person, but he's trying to describe the way in which the absorptive effect of the cinematic image washes over his perception of the city. And it is the anticipation of this sort of absorptive effect that leads him through the city into the darkened cinema auditorium. And this is Bart again. He goes to the movies as a response to idleness, leisure, and free time. It's as if, even before he went into the theatre, the classic conditions of hypnosis were in force. Vacancy, want of occupation, lethargy. It's not in front of the film and because of the film that he dreams off. It's without knowing it, even before he becomes a spectator. There is a cinema situation, and this situation is pre-hypnotic. According to a true metonymy, the darkness of the theater is prefigured by the twilight reverie, which precedes it and leads him from street to street, from poster to poster, finally burying himself in a dim, anonymous, indifferent cube where that festival of affects known as film will be presented. Now, Benjamin and Bart are working with two very different models of cinematic spectatorship. Benjamin is dealing with what we might call a cinema of distraction, one where cinema's political potential can be seized upon when the functioning of the, of the cinematic apparatus is exposed to the spectator at the same time as this apparatus presents new ways of seeing. Bart, on the other hand, is captured by, by what we might call a cinema of absorption, a cinema which 
suppresses the working of the apparatus and instead manipulates a spectator's desire through continuity editing to produce an illusory but coherently perceived narrative space. Yet in a curious twist, Bart's cinema auditorium could almost be Benjamin's bourgeois interior. Bart writes, it is in this urban dark that the body's freedom is generated. This invisible work of possible affects emerges from a veritable cinematic cocoon. The movie spectator could easily appropriate the silkworm's motto, inclusum labor illustrat. It is because I am enclosed that I work and glow with all my desire. Now this is almost Benjamin's interior, but not quite. The cinema auditorium is an urban dark, not the domestic interior removed from the city. Rather, it is the imagistic interior enfolded with the space of the city. It is precisely this recogni recognition of the continuity between cinematic interior and urban space that allows Bart not to be swallowed by the cinematic apparatus in its manipulation of his perception and desire. The emancipatory possibilities of a cinematic perception are seized upon by Bart through the ability to spatialize the image's effect and have this spatialization permeate interior and city. And this is Bart again. He writes, there is another way of going to the movies besides being armed by the discourse of counter ideology. By letting oneself be fascinated twice over by the image and by its surroundings, as if I had two bodies at the same time, a narcissistic body which gazes lost into the engulfing mirror and a perverse body ready to fetishize not the image but precisely what exceeds it, the texture of the sound, the hall, the darkness, the obscure mass of other bodies, the rays of light entering the theater, leaving the hall. In short, in order to distance, in order to take off, I complicate a relation by a situation." End of quote. For Bart, perception is intimate, interiorized, where illusion and criticality are twinned, where these possibilities possess two perceptual bodies. For Benjamin, perception is dispersed and urbanized, a critical position which would later inform what Bart calls the discourse of counter ideology in cinema theory. Yet in the poverty of this experience, there is promised a similar fluidity between interior and city, so long as illusion, nurtured by interior dreaming, is forsaken. Benjamin proposed that a distracted perception was held within the medium of cinema itself and was the quality latent in our habitual wandering through the city. One would gradually, and in a certain sense inevitably, learn this mode of perception through forsaking experience as attachment, as duration, and as a retreat into the bourgeois interior. But Spectator has learned this lesson in a different way, largely through the descent of a supposed political emancipation into another form of illusion. Bart's criticality requires not the smashing of the apparatus's illusions, but a doubling of the spectator's body, a kind of new alignment between the imagistic and the spatial that was promised in Benjamin's analogy between cinema and the experience of the city. In a kind of twist on Benjamin, Bart seeks out absorption and illusion habitually as a kind of spatial quest. If we return to the sorts of images with which this paper began, we can see the way in which the positions of Benjamin and Bart come into a novel alliance. In these images, uh, promoting a concept of lifestyle associated with the amenity of a view, the intimate is made urban or urbane the view from the private to urban domains turned inside out to mask the very domestic con construction required to attain such a view. Or these literally transparent domestic interiors turned outward towards the city to be worn as the revealing of one's identity. The conveyancing of which crystallizes an image that is the clearest index of such a narcissistic relation to the domestic. 
that which supposedly separates itself from the flux of the city is presented as an image in the city through the medium constitutive of its very distractions, its flux. In the interaction with city and image, an imagined city life built around domestic amenity blurs with the city left in its wake. consideration of an effect. That's, uh, it was written by Edgar Allan Poe. Having in mind the precise effect first, the author has then to find the situations, the persons and images, and the order which will produce that effect and not other effect. In its various registers of representation, the modern has a related but different function to play serving as an ideal antithetical to that of the private life uh, in either its reactive or critical versions, it lends up its forms to visions of individual identity, to visions of individuality, dissolved into an effect of collective life. As such, they have often operated to dissolve established boundaries within various forms of experience and cognition. This is necessarily a political question, an interrogation of the politics of inhabitation. By saying that, I don't mean a, a political way of uh, thinking of inhabiting spaces or a political way of describing that, uh, but an attempt uh, to examine and understand uh, the politics of everyday inhabitation. That means the complex of effects that are inscribed in the experience of spaces uh, that seem at first isolated from these effects. The historical transformations of all of the different institutions of privacy, of which the house is but one, at the same time necessarily transformations of the public. The space of the public uh, can never be thought outside that of the private, uh, precisely because the public uh, is has, al has, al has always been defined as that which is liter literally outside the private. In many respects, the private defines the public by marking its limit. It's exactly <laughs> the different manifestations of this limit uh, that I'm going to discuss today by looking at very, two very well-known uh, images. Uh, the one is uh, the pavilion uh, de l'Esprit Nouveau that was uh, pro um, realized by Le Corbusier in the uh, International Exhibition of uh, Des Arts Decoratifs in Paris in 1925. Uh, and the other is uh, the pavilion that, uh, uh, Patria Pavilion, the installation that the Smithsons realized in the exhibition, this is tomorrow, 30 years later in, in uh, London. Hypothetical architectural sites, or better, topological devices, the idea of home enacted here in different forms, in the form of the, can I move it backward? No, <laughs> that doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. So, um, so the idea of home enacted uh, in the form of the individual 
cell, in the, uh, in the <laughs> urban cell, but also in the form of a kind of archetypal shelter, here becomes a statement about territory and occupancy, and at the same time becomes an index of urban strategies. The iconography of this fragment, of course, recalls the historical specificity of these projects. If progress, rationality, and happiness were the key terms in the 1920s, and the post-war years could be encapsulated by an ethical notion according to which the personal universe of each individual, his or her intimate subjective reality, served as architecture's and urbanism's principal goal. Within a cultural climate that caused the reordering of ethical and aesthetic viewpoints, the question of dwelling was posed not only as a matter of housing shortage, but also as a philosophical and anthropological proposition. However, the interest of both constructions accrues around something that is outside of them, the architectural setting that literally supports the fragment. In both cases, the fragment is a piece of an ensemble, possible or constituted at one point. The fragment is at once constituted by and posits the ensemble out of, out of which it emerges. Going a step further, the categories of the found object, objet trouvé, and the as found, may begin to provide us with some clues to reflect on different ways of thinking about the urban as linked to, question, to the question of inhabitation. In these terms, the image of the house becomes less an embodiment of a concept of domestic life than a pretext to formulate and display modes of representation of an altogether different culture of the urban that seeks to emerge from the dominant modes of production of the present as well as modes of representation on the status of the, object, of the subject as constructed and situated by those same conditions. Le Corbusier wrote, the pavilion de l'esprit, le pavillon de l'esprit nouveau constitutes the architectural model of a system of inhabitation, of a cell, cellular unit, which can easily develop into the urban fact. And also that it concerns a program that develops its effects. The pavilion consists of two parts. The one on the right was to reproduce in full scale the cell of inhabitation, an example of the machine habité or machine to inhabit. This is the um, interior of the um, cell. Constructed entirely by standardized elements, the interior of the unit embraced all types of containers of things and activities designed and executed in scale. Mass produced the containers were juxtaposed following multiple combinations. A system of grouping and appropriating territory begins here to be on display. All elements were carefully placed and related so that the arrangement of the interior inscribes a strict economy of dimensions. Thus the container, the shelf, was being produced as the single object for domestic use while incorporating the common measure, la uh, commune mesure, and the, propos uh, the proportion that define the economy of the whole. The cell in its third was at once the individual unit and the particle of the urban phenomenon. Conceived of as an urban villa, the cell occupied a perfect cube perforated by the void of an indoor garden. The perception of the interior space was constructed so that to engage the visitor in a, ki in a kind of associative juxtaposition of frames, fragments of view, settings for living, and programmatic moments. That, of course, would recall uh, kind of the uh, techniques of monta montage that were investigated at the same time in the cinematography. As Hans Richter would write, uh, 
Fragmented by montage, the world was restored a unit reform by rhythm. Sergei um, Eisenstein, in his text Montage and Architecture, uses the Athenian Acropolis to demonstrate architectural space experienced as a sequence of composed views uh, as montage. The drawings are perspectival views and plans with line of sight, the movement along the ritual path are creating the sequence. However, the path has changed, quote from Eisenstein, nowadays it may also mean the path followed by the mind across a multiplicity of phenomena, far apart in time and space, gathered in a certain sequence into a single meaningful concept, diverse impressions passing in front of an immobile spectator. End of quote. Where, whereas architecture appears to present film in the technique of sequence space in time as frame views, the filming precedent here was to be found in the reconstruction of perceptual unity. In towards a new architecture, Le Corbusier also used carefully recomposed photographs of the Acropolis to illustrate his argument on the unifying power of the concept. Both Einstein and Le Corbusier use the concept of montage to reconstruct the identity of an architectural icon in terms of modern perception. But what is interesting is that Le Corbusier's filming discussion of the Acropolis directly precedes, precedes the chapter about his proposal for mass production housing. Casting the space for living, not only as a camera, not only as a frame, as a lens, uh, enabled by the way of seeing that, that, excuse me, by the way of seeing that was implicit to modernity. The typical unit appears to mediate the laws of nature with the laws of production. In plan, becomes a timeless fact as a frame that constructs a typical body. And this is a, a photograph by, from the Coop interior by Hans Meyer. In 1926, Hans Meyer published the Coop interior. The project was, in fact, a photograph. It depicted a room that never existed, but it was to provide an example of the dwelling. The objects are assembled in a conspicuous arrangement against, against the white back canvas and in an absence of defined architectural space. There are standard product, product types that operate with certain autonomy within the image, yet they engage in a pattern of iterated signs. In this sense, Meyer's scope room attested to the possibility that the typical, by linking the structure of subjectivity directly to the movement of mass production, could afford a, ki a kind of iconography of the new body, physical as well as social. The second part of the pavilion, another perfect geometrical element, was to contain representations of the future city. The, diora the diorama of the contemporary city for um, uh, two million inhabitants, which was a project first exhibited in 1922, and the diorama of the Plomb Voisin, projection of the, of the be, uh, above model on the city of Paris. The diorama becoming a significant form of visual imagery in the 19th century was based on the incorporation of an immobile observer into a mechanical apparatus and the subjection to a pre-designed temporal unfolding or optical experience. Its effects depended on the depiction of distant objects. In the case of Le Corbusier, the depth used to produce the effect of a unifying order and logic. As the architect put it, the aim here was to objectify the novelty. The existing city, selectively edited and framed, becomes the background against which the new urban skyline is to be erected and looked through by using the effects of a shifting perspective. The horizontal view of the mobilized frame, framing eye moves a restraint across the iconic fragments selected from the actual city. Following the classical tradition, the picture frame here acts like a window frame. These are three sketches uh, by Le Corbusier from uh, Rio de Janeiro. Uh, 
looking at the picture is like looking out of a window, although what we see in the frame is of course not the real world, but a fiction, a second world created by that second God, the artist. But whereas the presence of a frame is usually to bracket out the reality we inhabit and make us oblivious to what lies beyond the frame, here the frame supports a fusion of realities and scales. Frame and framed now seem to possess the same degree of reality. Here's the, the device of periscope he used uh, uh, in the roof terrace of the Bistiki apartment in order to collect views from the city. So this special ambiguity is strengthened by the relationship between the house and the city that is being thematized by this threshold. It is precisely this threshold that the imaginary inhabitant is constantly invited to occupy. And the eye can constantly invent the experience of both domestic and urban landscape. The phrase by Walter Benjamin, the city is now a landscape, now a room, could encapsulate this effect. The director, the film director, by means of montage, is able to reconstruct rather than represent the identity of reality. Likewise, here the architect reconstructs the site by fragmenting its identity. The Corbusier's frame exemplifies this technique. The site must, not, must, must now be reconstructed in such a way as to bear the place of the subject within itself. As Gideon would write, uh, the spectator must be in the center of the square. The viewing interpreting subject must be placed within the frame, not as some isolated point outside. The very same process was transformed by Siegfried Gideon into one of a hypothetical or imaginary restoration of the historical situation itself, whose reconstitution was at one with visual comprehension. The show, This is Tomorrow, that occurred in London in 1956, consisted of environments or constructions devised by groups, uh, each consisting of a painter, a sculptor, and an architect. The visitor was to be exposed to space effects, play with signs, and a wide range of materials and structures which make the art and architecture as factual as the street outside. The Pavilion Pavilion installation uh, by um, Alson and Peter Smith in collaboration with Nigel Henderson and Eduardo Paolozzi, though put together out of non-traditional materials such as aluminum and corrugated plastic, uh, exhibited an architectural form that was described in terms of necessities of human habitat. The first necessity, I quote, the first necessity is for a piece of the wall, the patio. The second necessity is for an enclosed space, the pavilion, end of quote. If the device of the frame invites a distant and aesthetic beholding, the approach here in the pavilion was to provide a space and shelter that the artist could fill mm -hmm. with objects and imagery. The patio and the pavilion, as the exhibit was called, was a habitat symbolic of human needs, space, shelter, and privacy and the objects contained represent the range of human activity. This is a um, Nigel Henderson uh, photo collage symbolizing man himself as an um, amorphous complex being. The pavilion was a shed in an equally metaphorical backyard, an ironic reinterpretation of uh, Lozier's primitive heart in the backyard reality of Bethnal Green. The symbolic objects made or gathered by the group uh, were laid out on beds of sand in a manner reminiscent of photographs of archaeological sites with the finds laid out for display. But within this gest gesture and the presence of everyday objects, the distant past and the immediate future fused into one. The pavilion patio was furnished not only with an old wheel and a toy aeroplane, but also with a television set. In brief, uh, within a decayed and ravaged urban fabric, uh, the affluence of a mobile consumerism was already being envisaged and moreover welcomed as the life substance of the new industrial vernacular. Whereas Walter Benjamin sought to read the hieroglyphics of the special and social configuration of the city in order to discover its mythology and construct its topography, this kind of urban archeology span 
intended to be a profane manifestation of a perspective of the immediate. In Benjamin terms, the activity of collecting itself, uh, quote, is a primal phenomenon of study. The collector having rescued his objects from their original functions was to bring them into a real context with other similar objects, reassembling reality and history into new configurations, into a whole magical encyclopedia, as he would say. The collector's activity, therefore, encapsulates both a negative moment, the destruction of the original context, and a positive one, the setting of the object in a new order of things and a new social vision. Whereas the fragment had in this context a cathartic potential to restore the myth of modernity by revealing the dreams of the collectivity wherever they were housed, here the object collected by the urban survivor was rather to be perceived into an aesthetics of waste, a transient aesthetic that becomes evocative of a fluctuating economy and which distorts the image of the modern individual whose mobility had been to reinforce the coherence of the whole. In these functions, quote, the characters remain portrayed as he found in that place, in that period of their supposed existence. And the architects reflecting further upon the 1940s and 50s on the period of uh, Dubuffet Pollock, the art, here's a, a painting by uh, Jean Dubuffet, the image was discovered within the process of making. It was not prefigured, but looked for as a phenomenon within the process. The vision here ce ceases to be cognitive as the rules change from moment to moment. An intricate pattern of coincidences and divergences seek to stimulate alternative forms of interaction. The intent was not the remaking of the visual field into a tabula rasa on which orderly representations could be arrayed, but into a surface of inscription on which a range of effects could be produced. Its aim being to form a coherent and apprehensible visual entity, as they would describe it, an image. But the way they understood the, the term image was more the thing itself in its totality and with all its overtones of human association. Of course, these investigations were anticipated in the um, Parallel of Art and Life exhibition in 1953. And there was also a very close connection between uh, the architecture as uninhibited in its response to the ni nature of materials as found uh, to the uh, actually music, uh, music concrete or concrete music in their response to natural sounds as recorded. Thus, the abandonment of, uh, by music concrete of any traditional kind of scale or even the 12-tone series gave a measure of the extent to which, uh, to which an art in architecture of art, another architecture, could be expected to abandon concepts of composition, symmetry, and proportion. In the case of objet trouvé or objet found, the thing becomes fragment through an act of dislocation and it is to be recontextualized within another arrangement in which fragments relate through geometry and special arrangements. Now the fragment found into a kind of archaeology of the present, objects produced out of ruinous materials and tropic in their disposition. In the first case, invented. In the second, collected from around the city, their accumulation enacting visual effects. The interior, oops. the interior becomes exposed to vision while the appropriation of the floor expands outward to that what was once oriented along a horizontal axis. What was once architecture oriented along a horizontal axis is now flipped within the space of the gallery. And in this expansion, or rather extension, into a new social space, the fragments provide an incisive recording of the quadian dimensions of architectural space, a conflation of the vertical with the horizontal, a flattening of plan and section. It generates a metaphor pointing to the conditions of its production. Here, by means of reflection, the reflecting surrounding walls, uh, 
the frame no longer an overall encyclopedic conceptual frame itself implodes. At the same time, the very presence of reflective surfaces creates a paradox in which a perception of the modern city lodged in the recovered territory of a fully embodied subject depends on the denial of the body, its reflections as a ground of vision. Thus, the as found was a new way of seeing the ordinary and openness as to how prosaic things could re-energize our inventive activity. As an art activity, they presented as something new. The found objects, for instance, as used by Marcel Duchamp, were once made objects. That is, the objects discovered and transformed into art objects were originally made in the mind by an artisan or engineer, then drawn or sketched or modeled and prototyped and so on, follow, following the whole process of invention and perception, a perfection. Challenging this process in which the first making occurs in the mind, the as found aesthetic fed the invention of the random aesthetic, uh, and as they said, of all the cluster ideograms, diagrams, and theories. This concept or understanding of image requires that the building also should be an immediately apprehensible visual entity and that the form grasped by the eye should be confirmed by experience of the building in use. Likewise, the city is being thought of as being made an urban form as outcome of its eternal structures, a process in which form and forming are not distinct. It's interesting how Rainer Barnum, under this prism, he uses the frame intuitive sense of topology instead of geometry. And the architect described the process as the one creating of creating plants structures which can stimulate the evolution of relationship between man and things. Thus the plan is more thought of and deployed as a finite structure that multiplies itself endlessly through experience, a finite structure able to release infinite eff effects. What is being suggested here is an understanding of the city as a layer field, a heterogeneous space defined by nonlinear interactions. This field and the place of dwelling in it becomes an object for, desi for design research. Though contemporary conditions, in order to end, um, are very different and there is a greater complexity in scale, it seems that there is a continuity of concerns and questions. In the 1920s, the notion of typical was used to illustrate a change in urbanity based on mobility, but where the needs of the nomads could be identified and standardized. In a contemporary context, it is less matter of literal displacement than of constantly changing programmatic needs. Design can no longer proceed by identifying typical needs and typical units that can be repeated in any context, representing a diagram of economic processes but it rather needs to mediate and implement a variety of atypical conditions. The city, a rather continuous developing surface, able to sustain and articulate internal and external forces as much as degrees of intensities, takes over and in many respects dissolve the stable and hierarchical relationship between the architectural object and its surroundings into a kind of expandable territorial fabric. Recently, architects have reflected the new understanding with topologically complex figures that elude any determination of inside and outside, folded and morphed datascapes where objects merge into fields, bring to, an arch to, uh, to end architecture's foundation in marking and defining limits. Thus, these earlier attempts to understand the city as a forming process rather than a form had been a challenge that many of the architects of the time faced in attempting to graft their strategy onto an existing living urban fabric and that remains as great as ever. Architecture began to change its urban validity from an object, monument, or icon to an integral part of the urban condition. And the notion of fragment began to serve less as a condition of modernity than as a strategy to redefine it. Thank you. <laughs>
Well, I'd like to thank uh, this morning's five speakers for a group of, I think, really interesting and stimulating papers. Um, I think that despite the fact that they have been on quite diverse subjects, that there are a number of issues which do emanate from them and serve to bring them together. Uh, we've moved, in a sense, from an idealized uh, and a unified world uh, of the Renaissance to the subsequent fragmentation of that world and attempts to keep that fragmentation at bay uh, and ending with Marina's kind of immersion uh, in, in this sense of the fragmentation. And, and, and I think that these raise issues about um, the kind of conceptualization of the spectator in all of these uh, various works that you're looking at. And so if I could just start to, to, to have a question to try to bring some of these together. Um, thinking on the one hand about Ernestina's two themes of intimacy and distance, and also of Nick Temple's uh, dichotomy between the Pope and the mob, I was wondering, this is, this is actually to Ernestina and to Tanis, if, if you could maybe speculate on some of the reasons why the mob uh, might have to be kind of kept out of the spaces of representation. Um, which I think was something which was in both in Ernestina and your photographs in which, which are kind of devoid of people and also in tennis with this kind of aerial distance of, uh, of, the, of the photograph. Um, uh, is this one, of the, one of the aspects of Galo's photography that, as I mentioned in my talk, that distinguished him from other pho photographers such as Hugo Breme, who's also a German immigrant, um, is that it, it uh, distance, distances itself from um, a picturesque tradition. Um, and often that is tied to the social representation of the city. Um, and it's, that he, Kahlo was a little bit, was more interested in, in representing the mechanics of, of the structure, the institutional structures of the city vis-a-vis um, -vis architecture. Um, so it seemed, it seemed quite focused on, um, on, uh, on maintaining that that subject in his photography. So uh, I think the, the figural representation would have detracted from those aims. Mm -hmm. the, um, uh, the aerial photographs, of course, are, um, we notice that you can't actually see people in most of them because they're, they're, they're too high. Um, even even when they, they begin to come down a bit, um, they're still quite. There is one photograph in of the outside suburb where you can actually see people, but it's very strange that they should equate um, the dense uh, area of of uh, Belleville and, and Melmonton um, with obviously, um, you know. A, a a very, a very bad situation in the city, whereas the, the area of Saint-Germain, where there's lots of green, green space and um, the streets are regular, that somehow, I suppose, there, there, there is there the equation of um, the Belleville and Menomonton with the mob, that these very dense uh, buildings are obviously inhabited by lots of people. Uh, so there is that sense in which um, if we could... Um, control this, this urban space, um, then perhaps we can control the mob. Um, it's never said that you know, these people are out of control, but there is that sense in which they must be because they're so densely packed, um, which I think is, is quite interesting that they've made this, this jump. And also the sense that the aerial photographs are revealing things which are invisible yes, yes. At, at street level. Um, and whether it's it's revealing something that they they felt was already you know that they had uh, it's kind of self fulfilling, or whether it really was revealing to them, uh, I don't know. 
Um, I'd like to open the floor to questions Larry. Just to follow up on that idea um, that the, the mob is unrepresentable, it, it, it uh, led me to think of two contrasting cases um, of the way in which one might try to think about uh, what is the large group of people one is looking at or uh, imagining in one's mind. Uh, and these, these two that I'm thinking of is, uh, would be the kind of 19th century, late 19th century understanding of the mob where there's this one, seemingly one particular moment where it, it stops being something so worrying and in, in the middle of uh, sociological discourses starts to be seen as that which will sweep away the outdated traditions of the past. And in that moment, it's, it's in a sense not something that can be very well represented because it's precisely a sovereign force that is beyond representation in the sense of not knowing precisely what it is, what it will do, how it performs, and so on. It's, it's a force. When I think about the places that I've actually been able to photograph from above large groups of people, where I've done that has been in Mexico City. And as you're looking over the Socolo, what tends to happen is that there's a large demonstration where you know exactly what the people are representing and you know how to represent them. And similarly, again, in Mexico City, uh, a demonstration coursing through the streets. And it's so, in, in a way, it's, I think that the sense in which the mob isn't photographed or doesn't show up as something to represent is precisely in the sense that the mob came to be seen at a certain point not as part of uh, representation in a political sense. And the moment that they uh, come to be representation in the political sense, of course, they can be framed. That would seem to also involve a kind of self-representation rather than the representation by others. Do we have any other questions? Um, Benjamin talks about uh, cinema taking on the burdens of new forms of perception in advance of how the mass might themselves learn or, or, or see that way themselves. So he does actually talk about um, distraction and learning about that mode of perception being a prerequisite or coming in advance of then being able to step back and look um, and that when one would do that one would, would have a kind of a different appreciation of what perception could mean. Um, so I, I kind of made mention to the fact that he said, Benjamin says cinema, cinema takes on this mode of perception as a kind of formal structuring um, and that it comes in advance of this form of perception being the norm. Now, what happens to cinema, and this is why I think Barthes is interesting to compare to Benjamin, is that that model doesn't hold for all of cinema. Um, it comes to be seen for its ability to, for one to be absorbed into it, um, for, for the continuity of editing to create a kind of uh, a clearly perceivable narrative space which which is 
contemplative, not in the same way Benjamin would con think of contemplation, but it is a contemplative mode of viewing. So there's a historical moment that Benjamin is talking about that's not particularly generalizable, and you can't say that this effect was then, as it were, taken up, um, because our understanding of cinema and cinematic perception also shifts as well. Um, and I think it does move to something more like uh, when we're comfortable with the codes, we can understand how to be absorbed into it. And the codes themselves shift and change to manage that absorption and, and the whole uh, sense of how we identify with character within narrative. Other questions? Can I make a yeah, comment? It, this, is, this is more of a comment than a, than a, uh, a, a question, I suppose. But, but a number of our speakers this morning have been talking about the window, which I found really very interesting in terms of um, controlling um, the city and uh, being the interface between the, the domestic and the, and the urban. Um, and there, it seems to me that there's a very rich strain there of thinking about how um, the, the bigger scale, smaller scale, and the public, the private, all this kind of thing, um, can be uh, managed. Um, I guess often we think of windows as being very useful in that they let light into interiors. Um, but when we think of them as, as being actually that interface between the, the, the domestic and the urban, um, controlling um, what might be perceived as a, as a kind of chaos outside. And, and you think of the, um, you know, the twitching of the, of the net curtain um, is, is a nice symbol of, of that, um, being able to control um, by observation what's, what's going on um, outside. Um, I don't know if any of you would like to say anything about that, but I found it really, really interesting. I'd just like to add to that um, and, and to, again, further speculate on this question of uh, um, the relative absence of people in the aerial ph photographs and Carlos photographs, and, and that is to draw the link between these two questions by way of the emphasis on the mechanical as um, a metaphor for um, um, the apparatus of institutions and uh, architecture providing that apparatus. Um, so somehow dissociating the mechanical um, slash architectural um, from the social um, and providing that separation, that ostensible separation photographically. Um, uh, so yeah, that's basically the idea. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that, that, that this issue about the window is um, does come up and is an important thread, and, and that we <coughs> we seem to be. I think that there are parallels to be drawn between the window, the kind of physical window on the one hand, um, perspectival construction on the other hand, camera, the kind of you know the, the mechanical lens of a camera. All of these are kind of based on certain kinds of ways of seeing, which are also I think um, assuming a certain kind of, of viewing subject. And, um, and I think that, and this was something I think that Marina was also talking about, a kind of transition from one way of seeing into another one. And that I think that, that this is definitely one of these currents that is um, kind of, you know, feeding through all of, all of your papers. <laughs>
be, <laughs> uh, <laughs> all will be revealed. Um, <laughs> but uh, I mean, you, you are right, and I think that was a deliberate uh, choice not to show anything from the outside to the team. It was more how um, things can be framed from us. Any other points? Yes. Do you want the The way I understand what Bart is saying is that the, um, as I say, he's, the way he is, ab is absorbed into the spectacle of cinema and that he might be tied into the narrative and be part of something um, begins to mean that when he leaves the cinema, he's, it's as if it's still a film and that he kind of ni also is kind of looking at himself as if he was still in this sort of space. So I think there's this kind of you know, um, that, that, that's my feeling about why he's using the third person, is that he's somehow within an image and that he's also a spectator at the same time. So these two bodies, it's like one's looking at the other or one's talking about the other, yet they're both him, right? Um, and at a certain point, you know, when that affect wears off, he kind of comes back together again or something. That, that's a yeah. I mean, that's a really interesting point. Uh, one slide I did show was of, was of this space Shibuya in Tokyo, where you have this building, which is called the Q Front Building, and it is this uh, television screen. Um, and there are moments when, yes, there is a camera in the space, and it takes an image of the space and projects it. So there's this doubling of of the space, where yeah, the the mob uh, or the mass the crowd can see themselves. And there's another uh, very curious thing that happens there. They have this service called the Love Board. Now there's this, the, the building becomes this thing, and it's the Love Board, and you send an SMS message of love to the board, presumably to be picked up by someone else, either standing right next to you or in the crowd. And, and so there's this kind of mediation of your love through the, <laughs> the image on the, or the message that you send to the board. So it's a, I mean, the way I think of it is it's, it's a mediating, entirely mediated experience that, that blurs this public-private distinction and that there's this kind of circuit that moves from um, the intimate to the, to the urban and back again. And that's, uh, I, just, I just found that fascinating. I, I, I uh, would, would like to know more about the everyday use of that and the kind of cultural functioning of that for, for young Japanese people. Well, the interesting thing is that this... Um intimate process is made public in the process.
yeah, and almost needs to be made public. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, the one, all the ones towards the end are in Sydney. Uh, there are a couple. The couple of the beginning was Sydney, so the the ANZ Bank was in Sydney. Uh, some from New York, uh, and some from Tokyo, but the bulk of them are Sydney. Right. It is interesting that the Australian examples and what really drove me to take this focus in this paper was that these are images of lifestyle. So in certain parts of Sydney at the moment, you have large-scale uh, high-rise um, apartment building going on at a very, very uh, high level. And all of these uh, developments are advertised and marketed very, very strongly about an image of who you are such that you would live in this building. So it's not a direct kind of uh, advertising of apartments as such. It's an advertising of a kind of subjectivity. It's a kind of entrains you into a way of being such that you would possess it. And that was the, the way I tried to understand that, that bookshelf example. So they're not advertising home loans per se, but there is a certain entraining of subjectivity into that way of thinking about domesticity such that you would then approach ANZ Bank for a home loan. Um, but quite clearly, it, it's this is this, all of the construction hoardings are, are often covered by images. Now, Sydney is obsessed with views. So the price of real estate is, uh, there's a direct relationship to how much of either the harbour or the city skyline you can actually see. So a lot of the architecture, the sort of return of, of neo-modernism or the popularisation of modernism is about uh, great deals of transparency between inside and outside. So often the, these are kind of buildings as, as se- facades as sections so that you can see from inside to outside very clearly, and that there's a direct relationship between that and the way they are imaged, so that there are images of these apartment buildings on the construction hoardings before the buildings are completed. Um, And also in the print media, um, Sydney is always, uh, it's always said that it's more interested in real estate than it is in architecture, so that there's a, a great interest in property, not necessarily in architecture, but in property, and the, uh, the amenities of view, and also, I guess, concepts of lifestyle and how that is traded and sold and what the uh, mechanisms for that are. So I think it is quite particular. I I, I suspect it would happen around London to a certain extent, but there's something about the topography of the city uh, and certain ideas of climate and lifestyle that make it particularly conducive to this very open uh, imagistic sense of the domestic. Maybe this, maybe this will be the last question because I'm sure people are. Well, uh, uh, I just was interested to bring back the intimacy and the te- technique of intimacy uh, or presenting or representing uh, or experiencing. So, um, you know, and we start with the, the window and the view and the hope to construct this whole space. I'd like to thank. Oh, I the kind of issue of intimacy is something that kind of interests me from from my kind of point of view, I suppose, from the research. Um, there's a, a piece of research which I've been doing on uh, the work of Robert Gross Test, Bishop of Lincoln, and supposedly the father of uh, medieval optics, and he made an interesting kind of uh, 
um, juxtaposition. He said that one's capacity to see is governed by one's capacity to love, which is an interesting idea. We talk about mm -hmm. kind of notions of the instrumentality of making known your affection. For him, love is the generator, is the determining factor of our capacity to really see, not just what is mere appearance, but to reveal what is otherwise hidden. <laughs> very nice, very nice. Now to end on. Uh, Tina, sorry, did you just have a... Thank to you, Vittoria, Marina, and Diana for organizing this conference. But thank you, Vittoria, for um, No, well it's, a, it's been a pleasure. We've had, I think, a very good start to the conference. So um, the spe for speakers, there's some lunch in the South Jury Room um, for the rest of uh, our guests. There, uh, there's food available downstairs in the restaurant, I think upstairs in the bar or obviously in, in the area. And we look forward to seeing you at two. <laughs>